these talks uh, is closely uh, related, so to say, in his research interests to what we are doing, and he has a new paper that he has offered to present, and we are happy that uh, that he will join us today for the presentation of this paper. And then we have Jefferson, who those of you at Kiel might already have met. He's a visiting uh, doctoral student at our chair. He has also overlaps, but in a completely different region. We have really multifaceted interests of research in our group. So we will have a heterogeneous high question. We will have a heterogeneous uh, session today, composed of two presentations on pretty uh, different topics. And yeah, I leave the stage to the presenters, and I'm happy that that uh, Klaus is going to uh, present to us his predictions about doomsday in the financial markets in due course. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Can you hear me, by the way? All right. Maybe I can share my uh, presentation. I think Professor Lux needs to uh, enable this function first so that I can share my screen. Yeah, now it works. Give me just one, one second. So, can you see my presentation now? Can you see my presentation now? Yeah, yeah. okay. So, uh, the research paper that I would like to present today is entitled Armageddon of Financial Markets. Is the U US equity market eventually going to co collapse? So, uh, what's the motivation for that study? So, as you might know, if you have a mean that, that, that is constant, through the compounding effect, it's eventually it has an exponential growth. But faster than exponential growth, which occurs when the mean is changing, uh, is manifested in an acceleration of growth rates. And that is not sustainable in the long term, according to Sonetti. If we now consider the... Uh, Dow Jones 30 index, the growth rate of return between the period 1780 to 1930, the, growth, the average growth rate was 3%. However, in the period that followed from 1930 until 2000, the growth rate shifted from 3 to 7%. And Johansen and Sonetti, in a 2001 paper, they proposed a log periodic power law singularity model. LPPLS model to estimate finite time singularities in the dynamics of world population and some financial indices. Among others, they used the Dow Jones 30 in index. And the authors found that the growth rates of both the world population and the financial indices are compatible with a spontaneous singularity condition occurring uh, around 2052, plus minus two years. And this would signal an abrupt transition into a new regime. In their 2001 paper, the authors used, as I already mentioned, the monthly data on the Dow Jones 30, covering the period 1790 until uh, 1999. Um, but in the ex post publication period of, of their seminal study, some extraordinary economic events have happened. For instance, in the early 2000s, we, we have observed the, dot, the burst of the dot-com bubble. Then we have also evidenced the global financial crisis period, which had a severe impact on the global economy. And now we have experienced a couple of years ago, just a couple of years ago, the COVID-19 crisis, where we have observed huge drops uh, in, in financial markets all over the world. And now we uh, still uh, have uh, observed the ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war that started uh, last year, which is still an uh, unresolved conflict. And all of these events had severe consequences on the economy. In, uh, in his 2017 book, uh, Sonetti pointed out that uh, 
the LPV LS model's prediction capability is more accurate as we approach the estimated critical time. And this, it is now important to, to note that since, their, uh, since the predicted time in their paper or for the critical uh, event is uh, 2052, so the point estimate, and their data and the, the data sample ended in 1999, 40% at more than 40% of the waiting time towards the critical event has already vanished. Moreover, he pointed out that uh, his proposed approach to calibrate the LPPLS model serves only as a first order approximation and novel improved methods have been developed that have not been published. Uh, and obviously the, LP, the LPPLS model is, is not a standard technique that is taught uh, at business schools, at least not in Barca. I don't know, maybe, maybe in, in Kiel you already teach it. <laughs> yeah. So what's the contribution of, of, of this study? So given the previously mentioned extraordinary economic challenges that we have uh, faced in the last two decades, it is important to reassess the relevance of a possible regime switch in the financial ecosystem, as predicted in the 2001 study from Johansson and Jonet. Moreover, there is a study from Hu Xu and Xang, published in the Review of Financial Studies, which is very well-known journal, they argue that uh, economics and finance, for instance, they are mostly observational in their nature and therefore it is important and critical to evaluate the reliability of published results against similar but not identical specifications. And the current, the current uh, study meets these requirements, so the requirements for a scientific replication uh, in line with Hamamash because First of all, there I employ a different population sample and time period and a similar but not identical approach to calibrate the LPPLS model parameters. Finally, uh, Sonetti pointed out, as I already mentioned, that, that his approach to calibrate the LPPLS model serves only as a first order approximation and novel methods have been uh, developed that are not published. Um, so there is a need for or a gap for, for some intuitive model setup that can be implemented using some standard software that even economists and especially financial economists can use. It's actually quite interesting that just today I listened to a podcast. Uh, the podcast is uh, uh, it's available on YouTube. It's called Trend Following. Um, and Soretti was interviewed here, and in that podcast, he uh, he, he argued or he, he he revealed that banks and and many financial instit institutions such as hedge funds, they dropped him an email and asked him if it's possible that he that he would send the code to him. So basically, if if you, if, you, if you read all these studies uh, on on LPPLS models, you you will figure out that. Uh, it's more it's more like a black box so uh, it's 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 not not really uh, obvious how to calibrate this kind of model since the but it, since it's a highly nonlinear uh, estimation procedure so the 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 data what data do i use uh, so i use data monthly data uh, from robert schiller's data library that is available for free at yale university and specifically, I use data on the S&P 500 as opposed to the Dow Jones index, like Sonetti and, and Johansson study. Moreover, I use data from January 1871 until November 2022. That means I use more than 20 years of, of an expanded sample towards the end of the sample, and I use about was it 80, 80 years less in the beginning of the sample. Then for, for the, to that's the, main, the main analysis and for robustness checks I use daily data uh, on the, also on the S&P 500 um, covering the period January 2nd 1980 until December 31, 1986. So this is the sample preceding the well-known stock market crash of October 
87. So here I try to uh, explore how this, 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 the, the model calibration that, that, that I propose here, how, the, uh, how well does it predict the uh, well-known 87 crash. And this is, this is the same sample has been used earlier in uh, Sonetti's, uh, some of his, his own research. And I, I compare my results with his results. Then as a second robustness check, I use uh, daily data on the Dow Jones index because the S&P 500 was launched in, in 1957. So, so here I, I go back, I use daily data on the Dow Jones 30 index where we have daily data available uh, also for the period uh, from 1920 until uh, 1928. So this, this, is, this is the period, the seven years period preceding the, the stock market crash of 1929. And this data is retrieved from another website which is stuk.com. So the methodology, how, how is the setup of the methodology? So I follow Sonetti and use a first a simple power law model for financial lock prices which is given by equation one where on the left hand side the dependent variable are the lock prices of, of some financial indi index here the S&P 500 on the right hand side we have the, the power law model where uh, a is must be larger than, than, than zero so that's the the, uh, the the price or the lock price of the S&P 500 at the time of the critical event. B is the loading against the uh, exponential growth term, which is uh, Tc minus T. And Tc is the critical time to the power of, of beta. It, and uh, according to the uh, literature, beta should be uh, between 0.1 and 0.9, and capital B should be smaller than zero. Uh, according to Torsonetti, this simple power law model needs to be expanded to account for periodic oscillations. And this is what we see in equation 2. So this is the, the standard LPPLS model from Sonetti. And we see here that we have the, on the right hand side, we have added the, uh, these brackets here, 1 plus C times the cosinus function. And this is basically the term that accounts for the uh, periodic oscillations and where capital C measures the, the exposure responsible for periodic oscillations. So omega is the angular frequency of the log periodic oscillations during the bubble formation and this last parameter is the phase parameter and according to the literature, to, according to the, literature uh, the absolute amount of capital C should be smaller than 1. And moreover, the constraint should be imposed that this omega should be between 5 and, and 15, so on, on this in, interval. But we will, we will come, come back to that later. So now you see already, if you see equation 2, so the, the implementation of, of the LPPS model uh, requires several model parameters to be estimated using a highly nonlinear model. So, and that's obviously a problem. And uh, using any nonlinear solver to find optimal values for all parameters at once, the, the, that will give spurious fits. And depending on, on, on how you choose the initial values, you will get different optimal values for the parameters, which is, of course, a problem. So a possible solution, of course, the literature has uh, also discuss solutions to that problem. So to, uh, to, uh, to address this, this problem, calibration of the model is typically based on some combination of finding suggested solutions for parameters, freezing some of the parameters, and using some nonlinear solver to find solutions for some of the remaining parameters. So what do I suggest here? So first I, I note that Sonetti argues that in practical applications uh, the more stringent criterion is used that beta should be between 0.2 and 0.8. And this, this has been found useful uh, to avoid patholog pathologies associated with the endpoints 1 and 0. So what, what I suggest to do is to treat beta as fixed. 
say, okay, beta is beta bar, and that is element of, it, it can be 0.2, 0.4, 0.6, or 0.8. Of course, one could ex also here expand it, one, one could take smaller steps here, but the point is to restrict first beta to be beta bar, setting capital beta equal to minus 1, because it should be anyways smaller than, than, than 0, and we, we can then say, okay, we, we can estimate this model. We get four different solutions, obviously, because we have four different uh, parameters, B, uh, beta bar. We can then use this, the optimal model of, of the first run, and then uh, we can... Uh, optimize the, this, opti this, model, this optimal model from the first step and use additional constraints. Where we then, in the, in the second run, we use the constraint that Tc should be larger than the next unit of the end of the sample. So this is capital T plus 1. And we use again the, the standard constraint that, that beta should be between 0.1 and 0.9. So then we get another optimal model from, from the second run. And then what, what we, we, we do, we use then the, the optimal parameters from the second run as initial values for the last run, for the third run, where we then use model two. So we plug in the, the, the optimal parameters into the second model here, where we set capital C equal to, and, and the phase parameter equal to zero. And then we vary the omega parameters on, on the interval that, that is allowed for, that is between 5 and 15. And we get for each of these runs optimal, optimal models with respect to the sum of squared residuals. So and then when we optimize model 2, we account at the same time for the constraints like for the uh, previous optimized model that Tc, so the critical time, should be at least the next time unit after the end of the sample. Beta should be bet between 0.1 and 0.9 and this omega should be between 5 and 15 because this, these are the, the standard constraints of the LPPLS model according to the literature. And the, the, the phase parameter here and all of these uh, optimizations, it, this remains un unconstrained because Sonetti points out that this parameter cannot be meaningfully constrained. So this is how it looks like. So one more time, so just briefly. So what we do in first, to this equation one, we set A equal to the last uh, price quotation of the index, which is here, which, which is the logarithm of P capital T, with the last, last price of the S&P 500. This capital B is set equal to minus 1. It, it, should, it should be constrained to be la, less than, than 0 anyways. And Tc, the critical time, is set equal to the time capital T, which which is the corresponding critical time when the last price quotation of the index is in the sample. So that very simple. So it's it's sort of the worst case scenario, right? Worst case scenario model. This is what you can think think about it. And then the only thing that that is here varying is this beta. But this beta we we have four we plug in four different possibilities and then we we get the corresponding sum of squared residuals for that model. It's a quite simple uh, and I think quite quite straightforward uh, approach. So this is then what what we get. So for the initial parameters uh, the, the corresponding values you, you, you see here we have four different specifications because we have four different we use four different values for for beta bar varying between 0.2 and 0.8 because these are the more stringent criteria used in practical 
uh, research. The critical time is the is the next time unit after the end of the sample, which is capital T plus one, and we say the we 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 the the um, the uh, price quotation of the S and P five hundred should be the last price quotation that we have in sample. And then also again, this, this capital beta is equal to minus one. So and what we see here is that the second model achieves the, the minimum sum of squared residuals. So then we, we use this uh, these parameterization as inputs for the second uh, optimization, where we use beta bar 0 0.4. And, and again, what we see here in uh, the panel B, the uh, split specification 2 gives us the, the minimum or the, 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 the minimum sum of squared residuals here. And this model suggests that the, uh, for instance, the, the, uh, when we reach the, the critical time, the S&P 500 in would be 33.24 in locks the quiet quotation when the critical time uh, is reached. So then we, we, we use this, this point estimate and plug it in into, into equation two. And, and using the constraint or using the initial values for, for C and the phase parameter of zero. And then we optimize again. And again, we, we use 11 different values for, for omega. And of course, we, again, we could use, of course, the smaller steps, but here we, I restrict omega to be part of the natural numbers between five and, and 15. So, and this is then what comes out. We see that, again, the second model here has the lowest sum of squared residuals. And we see also here that if in the, in the next optimization, we see that the values quietly, slightly change. We, we, we have seen previously, uh, for instance, the, the uh, price quotation of the S&P 500 should be in locks 33.24, but if we do the next optimization using the, the uh, expanded model, it's 36.08. So it's, it predicts a higher price quotation at the, price, at the time of the, call, of the uh, singularity. And also the, 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 others, the other values are changing. So we see here the optimal model predicts that the critical time is reached at time 179.53. And, and what that means, we will come back to this very soon. But we see here there is a, there's a variation in the critical time across, across all of these models. And the same is true for all the other parameters. So here I have plotted the, uh, the, the sample, the, the, the S&P 500 in, in locks for the uh, in-sample period, which is from 1871 until 2022. And we see here the, also the, the LPPLS model. And the sample, the sample ends, ends obviously where I have um, marked it here with the red arrow and the predicted critical time you, you see here on the, on the right hand side. So that's basically how the model looks like. And now we can also check the, the uh, residuals where I subtract basically from, from the log prices the, uh, what, the, what the model predicts. And this is what you see here. These are the residuals for the in sample predicted uh, calibrated uh, LPPLS model. So, and we see that in, in this uh, notation here, because one unit of time is one over 12, because we have, we're dealing with, with monthly data, uh, this critical time of 179.53 corresponds to 331 units of time in the future. Yeah, it's 331 units of time in the future from now onwards. So, and since the sample that I use ends in November 2022, the critical time must then be reached in June 2050, which is quite close to uh, to the prediction of Johansson and Zretti's uh, original study from 2001, who used a different data set and a different sample that already ended in December 1999. Then we need, of course, we need to test this model. How can we test that? So, like we know already from, 
from co-integration theory. So the residual should be a stationary process, right? This is what you typically learn in econometrics. Uh, the same is, 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 is applied here, but in the literature it is suggested that evidence for, for, for uh, LPPLS model, so, so for, for that, for a significant um, uh, relationship here, is given if we have a p-value of smaller than one. Usually in, in standard statistical tests, you use, a, you use a significance level of 5%, right? But here in this framework, the authors suggested to use a, a, a value of 1% instead. So and what you can do is you can use a, a, a standard AD, ADF test for that. And um, I, I, I ran the model, optimal lag order was two. And if you use this test regression here, you see that, that the delta zero, so the intercept term, and the delta 1, which is the, the loading um, against, the, the, uh, against t, are statistically not different from 0. So, the, opti so the, the, the correct model specification must be the model with no, de with no deterministic terms at all, which might be also quite, from visual inspection, quite intuitive here. So, and we see that the uh, test statistic is minus 3.89, and, and the p-value is here, you see, it's uh, less than, than 1%. So we, so we can conclude that we have here a statistically significant signal, LPPLS signal. Um, then we can next, we can, we can ask, okay, how can we estimate the confidence interval? Because obviously this is, this is just a point estimate. June 2050 is just a point estimate. But we, we can recall that all of these point estimates that, that we get here in the, in the last optimization are optimal. So what we can do is we can, just con we can just consider them as realizations of a sample. And what does that mean? So we, we see here the descriptive statistics of all of these uh, variables here. If I, if, the, if I consider one of each row are, realiza are realizations of, of, of the same process. This is what I, what I do. And then I estimate, are they, what's the distribution here? And, and I assume they are normally distributed. So, and this is in fact what comes out here. So we see that the, that the JB tests for none of those estimated parameters, apart from the phase parameter, are, all of them are normally distributed. Yeah, you, you see the p-value is much larger than, than five. 5%. The phase parameter, it might be not, not so surprising uh, that, the, that the phase parameter is not normally distributed uh, because it is also it, the only parameter that cannot be meaningfully restricted. So, but since the, all the other parameters are normally distributed, we can use that to estimate a conf confidence interval for our point estimate using the descriptive statistics. Very simple. And what comes out is that a 95% confidence interval using the, the sample statistics is from uh, 173 to 180, which corresponds, again, in this notation here, where one month is, is, one, is 1 over 12, is December 20, uh, 2043 and December 2050. And obviously, the optimal model is in the 95% confidence interval, right? We, we said it is, uh, was it June 2050? But it, 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 it is not the mean. This, this is now important to, to remember because, how, because we chose the optimal model with respect to the minimum sum of squared residuals, and that's model two here. So, uh, but it, it is important to note here that the critical time and the confidence interval are close to the figures derived in Johnson and, and, and Sonnet, corresponding to 2050, 2 plus minus 2, 10 years. But the 95% confidence interval using this intuitive first order model that I, that I propose here delivers a considerably tighter confidence interval than the 70% confidence interval derived in Johnson and, and Sonnet's research. And another interesting thing is 
that the point estimate for the critical time derived in, in Johansson and Jeanette study is outside the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval derived in the current research, which means that the critical time uh, that using an expanded data set, the critical time for, for a finite time singularity is, st is statistically significantly earlier than predicted in the 2001 paper from Johansson and Sonetti. Next, as, uh, as robustness checks, I, implore, I, I explore the model's capability to predict or post-dict the, the uh, well-known October 19 crash of 1987. Uh, I, I use the same data sample as Sonetti, and uh, in, in his research, the realized critical time is, or in his notation, is, is 87.80, which is the is October 19th of 1987, and his LPPLS model cali calibration pr produced two optimums, which are 88.35 and 87.68, which means that the that the first optimal time uh, um, estimates or or, or the, the, the the first optimal time uh, overestimates or yeah estimates the, the critical time 200 days later than October 19 and the, the last optimal or the last optimum expects the crash 44 days too early. So on, on average um, the error is 122.5 days. But the first order of, uh, of, of um, approximation that I propose here reduces this error by 25%. And the same evidence is found when using or when, when, when in, in, in investigating how well uh, my first order ap approximation can predict the uh, crash of October 23, 1929. So to conclude, uh, this current research um, uses some, some novel approach to, to calibrate the LPPS model and it uses an extended data set for accounting for more than 20 years of, of data compared to earlier research. And the proposed calibrated LPPLS model suggests that the US equity market reaches a singularity condition already in June 2050, um, and that is in line with earlier research forecasting a regime switch in 2052. And of course now the question arises, uh, what does that mean? Um, and the first and perhaps most obvious uh, solution uh, or scenario is a collapse, like we evidenced in, 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 uh, in October 1987 or October 1929. It could be also a, a transition to sustainability, or it could be uh, res resuming accelerating growth by overcoming fundamental barriers. But now the question, so there are three, three different scenarios, what the singularity condition could mean, and now, of course, you may wonder, okay, what's the most likely scenario? So it's, it is obviously I'm, I'm not, not an expert, <laughs> okay, I'm just a financial economist. <laughs> but there's Ger Geoffrey West, I read a book from Geoffrey West, he's a physicist, a very, very well-known physicist. Um, and he wrote a book, so he's obsessed with power laws, and he, he, he wrote a book in 2017, uh, which is entitled Scale, very interesting book, very interesting read. Uh, and he um, talked about the same topic, basically, uh, and, and, and he argued that in this regard, unfortunately, however, it's not quite as simple as that. There's yet another major catch, and it's a big one. Because, of course, e economists usually, what they would like to see is the, the third scenario, okay? resuming accelerating growth. Because this is what, what economists usually want, like open-ended open growth. Um, the theory dictates that to sustain continuous growth, the time between successive innovations has to get shorter and shorter. And these paradigm shifting discoveries or innovations, um, adaptions and innovations must occur at an increasingly accelerated pace. Not only does the general pace of life inevitably quicken, but we must innovate at a faster and faster rate. And obviously he is not that, let's say, optimistic in his view as um, 
economists are, because he argues that it is um, it's it's less and less likely that such innovations suddenly occur that may result in a in a accelerating growth. Um, and another interesting voice is Ray Dalio, who, whom I also consider as an, uh, let's say, trustworthy uh, expert because, first of all, he has seen many, many things in his life. He uh, has the founder of Bridgewater Associates, which, is, which runs the, the, the world's largest hedge fund, very successful hedge fund. Um, and he, he expects also a regime switch but he uses a different te terminology. Uh, he recently um, wrote, wrote a book uh, entitled The Changing World Order, where, where, where he studies major empires and, and compares the successes and failures of, of the world's empires throughout history. And in studying this issue, he identifies some critical factors that supposedly result in, in the regime switch or in the change of world order, as he puts it. And obviously he he, he points out that the U.S. is obviously highly in, in debt and the lion's share of the U.S. debts are held by, by China. So, and the, the growth of the Chinese economy will soon overtake uh, the U.S. And since they are the major debt holders of the U.S., the, the impact of, 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 of China on the world economy uh, will be much, much larger. And the U.S. obviously the impact of the, of the U.S. how the U.S. can set the rules for 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 the world economy uh, will uh, vanish. So this is basically uh, what what is the prediction or or the the view of of Ray Dalio on on this uh, issue. And he is uh, again he, he is not a theorist he, he is more more a theorist uh, more a practitioner. Who is running hedge fund and also actually gave advice? Uh, I think it, it was when 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 we had the in, in, in 2010 the European debt crisis when he supported the uh, EU government. So so he he is obviously a well known known expert, but uh, has practical has a view of a practitioner. So that's. Uh, my presentation and I would like to, to thank you of course for your attention.